It was late winter in northern Russ, the air sullen with wet that was neither rain nor snow. The brilliant February landscape had given way to the dreary gray of March, and the household were all sniffling from the damp and thin from six weeks fasting on black bread and fermented cabbage. But no one was thinking of chilblains or runny noses or even wistfully of porridge and roast meats, for Danya was to tell a story. Hi, I'm Rebecca of Conquer Books. I am Nicole of Conquer Books, and we have read together The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. We're going to talk about that today. What you heard from Nicole's opening, um, the opening paragraph of the book, and you get this chilling sense that there's this fairy tale coming um, from Dunya, who is this um, grandmother figure in the book, and that's because this book is essentially a Russian fairy tale, and it's dark and mysterious, there's magic, there's feminism, there's a lot of different themes, and it's really beautiful writing as well. Yeah, her descriptions are really poetic, and those were actually my favorite part of the entire book, is how many different ways can you say you were cold? <laughs> um, it reminded me kind of uh, the descriptions of On the Road by Cormac McCarthy. McCarthy. How many different ways can you say the landscape was gray? Um, it was dead. <laughs> yeah, but um, she was b very beautiful in the way she said that. And the story that Dunya goes on to tell, she starts telling a story about an evil, evil stepmother who hates her stepdaughter. And she sends her stepdaughter, tells the husband to take stepdaughter out into the woods so she can marry Morozko, the Winter King. Is he the Winter King? Winter King, Frost King, King of Death, all of those cold, dead things. Multiple names. So they lay her in the snow and she freezes and she freezes and Morozko comes and he blows wind on her and says, Are you cold, lass? And she is well-bred enough to say, I am fine, I am fine, you know, not to trouble her, her host. Demon host. Demon host. <laughs> and he continues to blow the wind and she gets colder and colder and finally he says, you are brave, and he gives her a huge dowry mm -hmm. and sends her back home. But then the stepmother sends her biological daughter out and she's like, you are going to get so much more money, you're going to get all these beautiful fur coats, and her daughter never comes back. And eventually she sends out her husband and he finds her frozen dead in the snow. So it's an interesting way to start a story with a very small story, a, a fairy tale. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about this story was I haven't read a lot of things set in Russia, and so I felt like um, I learned a lot about Russian mythology and culture and what it was like living in Russia during the Middle Ages. The Bear and the Nightingale follows um, a character named Vasya, and she's a young girl and her mother dies in childbirth and her father goes to Moscow to get a new wife, a stepmother. And um, Vasya isn't the typical girl in the village. You know, she's always sneaking off to run around in the woods and um, instead of doing her chores, she's not very good at cooking or sewing. She asks the men, even the adult men, questions and like it's outrageous to everybody. Um, she doesn't go to the church and do her prayer, prayer dutifully. Um, she's not what anybody would think of as a, a good girl or, or a good wife. And it gets even worse when she realizes she sees spirits and she sees um, some of the, the demons in the forest. Um, guardians of um, ponds or household spirits who live in the um, oven or who live in um, the, the bathing area who um, traditionally um, Russian folk people would leave um, like a bit of bread or um, some milk to um, give their offerings to these spirits so that these spirits would then watch out for them and protect their household. Um, Vasya becomes friends with many of these spirits and she builds a lot of skills in um, talking with them and helping them. They called Vasya Little Frog too. That yeah. was her nickname because <laughs> they said she was very ugly. Um, which, which I actually appreciated because a lot of times when you think of a fairy tale you think of a beautiful maiden. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine Arden the author here. She um, spent some time in Russia for um, a study abroad and she comments on how the ancient Russian folklore has spirits, guardian spirits, for everything. She says everything that they owned or that they built back in those days they had a spirit to guard it. Mm -hmm. And so the narrative really um, steps up a notch when 
her um, her father goes to Moscow to get this stepmother and this man comes and gives him this jewel and he says that he has to bring it back for his daughter and um, the father Pyotr is of course like uh, no I'm not doing that uh, but then um, the man threatens to kill his oldest son and we later find out that he is the frost demon and you wonder what his interest is in Vasya and what he could have in store but um, the narrative actually plays out over um, a decade maybe a little bit more as she's coming um, into adulthood. The woman that Piotr is set up with to be his new wife, the stepmother of his four children? Five children possibly? Five. Her name is Anna and she is from Moscow and the Grand Prince kind of wants to get rid of Anna because she's a little, a little crazy um, but she's not actually crazy. She happens to be able to see the same spirits that Vasya can see. Mm -hmm. um, but this isn't good because Anna thinks thinks that she's crazy and she thinks that she needs a priest to save herself. So she sends uh, for a priest, for a very good priest who's going to come, who's going to change this deep forest landscape of the pagan ways. Mm -hmm. And so um, Constantine comes, who is the priest, and he is pretty upset at being sent into um, the wilderness, essentially, because they live um, far, far away from um, Moscow. And so he doesn't come in with very good terms, and he knows something's different about Vasya right away. And he doesn't like it because it threatens his religious um, ideals. Um, but he grows to have a relationship with Anna um, in a very authorita authoritative um, position where, you know, he is trying to save her from these visions of these spirits that she's she's seeing. Um, and Vasya really resents what he is doing in her community because he's inviting in a lot of change. He's telling um, the peasants that they can't give their offerings to the spirits of the household or the spirits of the wood, um, that that's paganism, it's wrong. And so those spirits start to fade, and they were the ones providing protection to the village and protection to um, the surrounding forests. And as that protection fades, I mean, things really get real with some other different, uh, less nice spirits. Yeah, what you're missing here is that Morosko has a twin brother who is quite evil, who also has his eyes on Vasya and, and the town. Girl. Nicole was taken by a viper! <laughs> I guess I didn't know um, what would define a fairy tale versus a modern story because what is a fairy tale except an older story? Um, and I definitely got not so much that the story is so different, but the way it's written is different. It's about um, entire lifetimes, it's about the traditions that went on in that culture, they lay very heavily through the story. Um, you get a different kind of character in Vasya than you would with a lot of the Western fairy tales or modern stories. Western uh, tales um, rely on this heroic person who's brave and is ready to conquer. Mm -hmm. And Vasya is very brave, but she's always, she's also, um, she's looked down upon. And Russian fairy tales, I guess, rely very much on the normal person who's a little bit awkward, a little bit goofy, and that's very much what Vasya is, and I, I enjoyed that. A yeah, lot. <laughs> she's very endearing. Yeah. Um, I also thought it was great that she was such a strong female character and um, as you read through the book, you know, your heart kind of breaks for her because she's really not that that different. Like she wants to do what she wants to do and she doesn't want to do her chores and she, you know, um, has some different ideas about what life should be like. But things completely split apart in her life because of those small subtle changes. I mean yeah. subtle for us coming from, because you know, 21st different. century. Yeah. Um, there's basically two options for her as a woman, um, get married or go to a nunnery. And she doesn't want that. She wants adventure and she wants to lead her own life. And there's really no path for her going forward. And I think that that struggle, both like her internal struggle over whether or not she's a good girl or a good person, but then also the external struggle of how everybody else is viewing her and the obstacles they put in, in front of her to try and make her into who they think she should be, um, I think was really what captivated me in the book and um, really brought me into to those um, characters more. Mm -hmm. So our book for November will be The Tomorrow Factory, a uh, collection of short stories by Rich Larson. And it just came out yesterday, so it's brand new. Read along with us. It's all speculative fiction, lots of science fiction. He has amazing reviews about his short stories. He had a debut book earlier this year, too, so um, he's a pretty hot author right now. I'm excited about this one. It should be fun. Yeah. 
All right. Thanks. See you next time.